Welcome to today's webinar, The Importance of Estate Planning When Facing a Crisis. My name is Krista, and I will be the facilitator of this call. First, let's cover some housekeeping notes. During the presentation, if you experience any trouble hearing or seeing the webinar and need to communicate with us, please use the Q&A function. The Q&A can be found on the left side of the screen under the presenter's photos. If technical issues persist, please call our office at 508-994-5200. If you have a question about the content, please feel free to submit that question via the Q&A function at any time. We will save all questions for the end and answer them at that point. Also at the end of the session, you will receive a survey where you can express your interest in next steps, which we will cover before the Q&A. Serpidot and Bineski, is an estate planning and elder law firm with offices in New Bedford, Hyannis, and Easton. The firm is comprised of four attorneys. The two partners, Michelle Bineski and Dan Serpinot, along with attorneys, Erin Nunes and Brandon Wallica. To begin today's presentation, here are attorneys Dan Serpinot and Erin Nunes. Welcome everyone, this is Dan Serpinot. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, I'm Erin Nunes. Thanks for joining us. So these are crazy times. I hope everyone is staying safe, staying relaxed, sort of enjoying the, the quiet time and, and the things that are positive, uh, the family time and the relaxation, hopefully, during this COVID crisis. Uh, keep your physical and your mental health. So we've been getting a lot of different concerns from a lot of different clients, obviously, during this time. So we just thought it would be helpful to address uh, some of these concerns in a webinar. That's right. If you're like most of us, the coronavirus pandemic undoubtedly has you on edge. We've all been forced to face our fears in some way, whether that's the fear of falling ill, losing the job, or having to spend time alone. With all of these anxieties and unknowns unknowns weighing on your mind, it might feel like there's suddenly a pressing need to get your affairs in order. So Dan and I are here today to talk to you about some of the estate planning that you should have in place, especially during the crisis, just in case. Absolutely. Um, it's always good to be prepared now more than ever. Life changes and brings us surprises, not just this COVID-19 situation, but some of you may read, I personally uh, suffered a heart attack and quadruple bypass surgery in January of this year. Certainly did not expect that at age 50. So uh, life changes and brings us the unexpected. So an estate plan is important and meant to ease your fears in all of this. It's meant to uh, make sure that your family never finds themselves unprepared in the crisis. So let's start by taking a look at some of the common issues that families face when a loved one is incapacitated without the right estate planning documents in place. Your family will have no power to make medical decisions on your behalf. There can be family infighting and stress over what the right medical decisions should be. They're not gonna have the ability to access your bank accounts to pay your bills. They're not gonna be able to write checks on your behalf or apply for medical insurance or benefits that you might need to pay for a hospital stay. They might find themselves in court for long and stressful court hearings to get the legal authority that they'll need to be able to step into your shoes and make financial and medical decisions on your behalf. In the current COVID-19 climate, these are serious and potentially life-altering concerns. Like many businesses, the courts are closed or placing serious restrictions on the number of people that are allowed in the court at any one time. As a result of all of that, the process for you to get the legal authority to make critical decisions on someone's behalf could take months without having the proper estate planning documents in place. But fortunately, with some simple estate planning, you and your family can be protected from these types of situations. 
Absolutely. So let's talk first about some of the foundational documents that people should have in place uh, so they can act in a crisis. First of all, let me comment that um, people of any age, really over 18, should have these foundational documents in place. Even a 18-year-old college student who may find themselves in the hospital or uh, in the infirmary would need to have put in place documents to name their decision makers, financial, but probably more importantly, medical decisions, life support and respirator. So, so let's talk about them. Some people may be surprised to hear that the will or even a trust are not the most important documents to focus on first uh, in a lot of situations. Estate planning is more than just a will. A strong estate plan will also include other documents like a durable power of attorney for legal and financial decisions, a healthcare proxy for medical decisions, a revocable trust in a lot of cases, sometimes called a living trust, uh, and others. It's important to look at the whole situation and uh, each document addresses a different aspect of it. In light of the current COVID situation, probably the two most important documents right now are the durable power of attorney and the healthcare proxy. This is you naming someone to make your legal and financial and medical decisions. If you don't have them in place, as Aaron mentioned, and you lose mental capacity, someone will be, be trying to go to court to be named your decision maker. And that can be difficult and lengthy during these COVID times. So first, a little bit about the power of attorney. This is you naming who you want immediately to make your, uh, your legal and financial decisions. So it's bank accounts and paying the mortgage and filing the taxes. It's also potentially the person who would be applying for mass health to pay for your care, for um, IRAs and qualified retirement plans, 401Ks, someone may need to access those, make changes or, or move them in some situations. To deal with Uncle Sam if there's an issue, to deal with the life insurance company if there's an issue, to find out about cash value and, and death benefit amounts. All of these are things that a, you would name a durable power of attorney to do in a crisis. So we don't have to go to court with the delay and the cost associated there. It's an important consideration nowadays with the courts closing or operated at a limited capacity. Erin, you want to touch on the healthcare process? Absolutely. So in addition to the, the power of attorney, it's really important to have a good, thorough healthcare proxy in place. And I should mention that on both of these documents, the power of attorney and the healthcare proxy, it's important not just to have a primary agent named in that document, but also an alternate, someone who can step in and fulfill these roles for you if the primary person you named isn't available to act on your behalf. So as to the healthcare proxy, you know, unfortunately, tragic events often happen out of nowhere, which is why it's really important and good to plan for these things ahead of time in case you have a lengthy hospital stay or an incapacitation. During those times, one of the most stressful things that your family is going to worry about is your well-being. And if you haven't appointed someone to make your medical decisions, there may be a disagreement in your family about who should step in, and they may end up in court, and a court could be the one to choose who makes those decisions for you. So it's really important that while you can, that you take the time to name who you would want to step into your shoes to make these medical decisions for you. Think about the difficulty and the stress it could cause your family and the impact that it would have on your health care to not have a health care proxy in place. It's a crucial document that authorizes someone that you trust, your patient advocate, as well as at least one alternate to make medical decisions on your behalf. The health care proxy empowers someone to make your medical decision making if a doctor determines that you can't make those decisions for yourself. 
In addition to the healthcare proxy, it's also really important to have another advanced directive, sometimes referred to as a personal directive or a living will. And Dan's going to talk to you a little bit about what that is. Thanks, Erin. So a living will, like you said, sometimes called an advanced directive, is really you giving guidance to the person that you named in your healthcare proxy to make your medical decisions. So this is guidance in writing on things like <clears throat> which circumstances you would like to be on a respirator, which circumstances you would not, if you would like life support or not in this or that cir circumstance. But also other things you can give guidance on, like if you'd like to be buried or you'd rather have a cremation or where you'd like to be buried or where you'd like your ashes <laughs> scattered or what songs you'd like sung at your arrangements. Also things like CPR, uh, artificial nutrition, when you'd like that, hydration, pain relief issues, artificial respiration, whether or not you want to be an organ donor. All of these things go into a living will to give guidance to your family. We've seen through the years um, wonderful caring families with honest children just simply disagree on some of these things, especially life support during a crisis. And the kids all love the parents just as much as their siblings, <clears throat> but, they, but there can be hard feelings if there's a disagreement during, during crunch time. So a living will is a nice gift to the family so that the person making the decisions can show their siblings and other family members Say, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is mom, these are mom's wishes or dad's wishes. So this document can be a big stress reliever for your family so they don't feel guilty or stressed when they're making these medical decisions. That's right. And in addition to the healthcare proxy and the personal directive, it's also important to think about your medical information and how your loved ones might be able to access that. So while your healthcare proxy might have language in it that allows your agent to access your medical records, it's not uncommon for doctors and hospitals to refuse access to your medical information without a standalone HIPAA authorization. And HIPAA is, is basically the law that says that your medical information is private. So doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, can't just be giving your information away to anyone who calls to ask about it. And that might be wonderful 95% of the time, but there may be specific people that you want to have access to your medical information, especially now. You might want uh, your spouse or a child or another loved one to be able to talk to your doctor about test results or to call your insurance company to handle a billing list. And if they don't have the permission to access your medical information, what they're going to likely hear is, I'm sorry, you're not the patient. I can't share that information with you. So it's really important that you have a standalone HIPAA authorization that allows your, uh, your agents and your family members to have access to your protected medical information so that they can freely speak with your doctors, nurses, health insurance companies, uh, your pharmacist about prescriptions that you might need. The HIPAA authorization um, really opens up the doors of communication so that people can uh, learn about what health um, care that you might need. That's a great point, Aaron. You know, we, we don't always know where we might land in a crisis. I may have signed a HIPAA release with my doctor's office but I may land at Toby Hospital or Mass General or somewhere. So that standalone HIPAA release is very important. So let me, exactly. let, me address, let me address the will or last will and testament briefly. People pretty much know what a will is. It divides your assets up in the probate court when you pass. So what people don't sometimes understand is not everything goes through probate. It depends how it's titled, if it has beneficiary designation on it, if it's jointly owned, if, it, if it's in a trust. So some things will go through probate and therefore go through your will, and some won't. So we really have to look at that and keep that in mind when we're planning. Um, a good will will have a 
some things that will make life easier during the process, like a license to sell real estate without having to go back into court to get court permission, or a, a waiver of sureties on the bond so we don't have to ask people to guarantee they'll pay the money back if if you steal, if your executor steals or your personal representative steals or does something wrong. Or in some cases, we want a will with a special needs trust in it for the surviving spouse. And that can help protect assets uh, for the surviving spouse if they need care later. So that's sometimes appropriate. Little, uh, a little more lengthy discussion is a little beyond today, but um, we can talk to you about it in the office. But if you don't have a will, the state has written one for you essentially through the laws of intestacy, which say um, who would get your assets. And it can cause a number of issues to, to leave it to that in certain cases. So we want to usually designate the order of things and then have backups. You know, if this person can't serve, it would be that person. If this person isn't living when I pass, then I want these assets to go to their children, let's say, or whoever you'd like. So it's important to get a good will in place. Um, and, and then a trust in some cases. You know, there are different types of trusts. There's an irrevocable trust, which is usually done to protect assets from care costs and a Medicaid lien. <clears throat> That's a little outside of the scope of today. But we, today, we really want to talk a little bit about a revocable trust, which is done for a number of reasons. Number one, probate avoidance, you know, to, to have your assets pass immediately and privately to your kids or whoever you're giving them to when you pass and not have to wind through the probate court process. Also, a revocable trust can be very helpful if you have minor beneficiaries, you know, kids under 18, or if, you know, your grandkids might be under that age. They may be getting something if your child uh, can't um, receive the inheritance they passed with you or something like that. So minor beneficiaries, also special needs beneficiaries. Trust will be very helpful in setting up things to keep needs-based government benefits for special needs beneficiaries, money management for them. Another thing that a revocable trust can do uh, for married couples is minimize a state tax or in some cases eliminate a state tax. So if that's your situation, uh, we'll talk to you about that. It, a revocable trust can protect assets from your children's divorce or potential divorce in the future if drafted properly. So if that's an issue you're concerned about, you know, we can handle that in your planning. It can keep assets in your bloodline. Like some clients are concerned that they may, uh, their child may pass and assets would go to their child's uh, spouse rather than the grandchildren. So a lot of clients will want assets to pass to the grandchildren, um, at least some of them, rather than to the surviving spouse who, who may remarry or use the assets for something else. So all of these things are, are things that we can handle in a revocable trust, which is a little, a little beyond the or a lot beyond the, the average will. It can maintain flexibility in your estate plan. It's revocable, changeable, amendable as life goes on. So if you ever want to make a change in it, you can certainly do that. So that's just a little bit about those documents. Aaron, can you speak a little bit more about uh, minor children and, and how to plan for, for them? Absolutely. Um, as some of you may know, I'm a mother myself, and I have three young children at home. So I worry about, you know, who would take care of them and, and what would happen to them if, if God forbid, myself and my husband uh, were sick or, or weren't available to take care of them. So it's just really important, obviously, to make sure that your kids are taken care of by someone you trust if you can't take care of them yourself. You know, if you're a single parent and you have young children at home, who could step in and take care of your kids if you fell ill or you were in the hospital? Or even if you're married, you know, what if both you and your spouse became incapacitated? Who's going to step in for your children? If you have kids who are under the age of 18, it's really important to have documents in place to make sure that someone you trust is legally 
appointed to take care of them if you can't take care of them for yourself. So some of the documents that you um, should consider in order to appoint people to these critical roles in your children's lives can include uh, nominations of first responders. That document names people who have the immediate authority to step in and care for your children at a moment's notice. It's also important to have nominations of temporary and permanent guardians. That document names the people who you trust to raise your children with the values that you consider important. It's also important to have medical powers of attorney in place for your kids. That document grants certain people with the ability to step in and make health care decisions for your children if you cannot. That's great, Erin, all very important. Um, let me turn now to our senior loved ones, some of the most vulnerable in our community, and a little bit about uh, what happens if, that, if, if our seniors need more care than a spouse or even family members can provide. Um, and we need some in-home care or in some cases, uh, facility care, skilled nursing facility care. Um, we want to be prepared for, for those times and not for everyone, but for many clients, we can apply for Medicaid to pay the bill for the care in a skilled nursing facility, which is going to be roughly $14,000 a month uh, without Medicaid, or we can, in many cases, apply for Medicaid in the home to bring people into the senior's own home to care for them and keep them out of the facility. So we'll look at the overall situation and the assets and the income and, and the amount of care needed and put the best plan together for that client. We are very concerned, as are you, in this COVID-19 environment about the safety of any of those arrangements. You know, that uh, we can help families screen and ask questions with facilities about their precautions and whether or not anyone has tested positive in those facilities. And the same for home health care agencies, which who, they all try really hard to follow the right procedures and make things as safe as possible. We just want to make sure we're asking the right questions. So there are, we're going to go through some of the rules in qualifying, not all due to time, but some. And I just wanted to say at this point that there is both institutional or nursing home care Medicaid and what we call community Medicaid. That can be under a waiver program that, I think Aaron will talk a little bit about. There are several programs under that community umbrella, the Choices Program, the PCA Program, the Group Adult Family Care Program, and we can walk you through each and let you know the pros and cons of each and which might be best for your family. So, Aaron, can you talk a little bit about the waivers? Sure. So under certain Medicaid waivers, which include the Home and Community-Based Services Waiver, uh, which is sometimes commonly called the Frail Elder Waiver, participation in that program is limited for services that you're going to receive at home um, or in an adult daycare or adult day health setting with different income and asset limits depending on if you're an individual who's applying or a couple with only one spouse who needs the benefit or if both members of the, the couple are going to be applying. But if you do qualify, uh, some of the things that the waiver can help pay for uh, include Meals on Wheels, caregiver support programs, home support, personal care attendance, transportation to and from doctor's appointments, um, adult day health, uh, senior centers. But unfortunately, you know, those programs don't pay for, or generally don't pay for 24-7 care in the home. So unfortunately, if home-based services are, are just not enough and it's no longer safe for you to be in your home, you might consider placement in a skilled nursing facility. As Dan mentioned, in our area, uh, to private pay for skilled nursing care or long-term care ranges anywhere from about $12,000 to $15,000 per month. 
if you're like most people who can't afford to write that check every month for that care, you might be wondering what's out there to help you cover that cost. So Dan's going to talk for a moment about the Mass Health program that can help pay for that. Sure, thanks, Erin. So, so Mass Health in Massachusetts is Medicaid. We'll use those terms interchangeably, and we'll talk about the asset limits for individuals, for couples, and in situations where both spouses need care and need uh, Mass Health to pay for that. I want to just initially separate in your mind Mass Health or Medicaid from Medicare. Medicaid is a long-term benefit which will pay for long-term care. Medicaid, Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicare is a short-term benefit that will pay for short-term care like doctor's visits and hospital, uh, hospital stays on the short term, usually up to 100 days, but you're not guaranteed to get all 100 days. And it usually pays for the first 20 days in full, and then there's a copay. In order to get Medicare, you generally need to a uh, qualifying hospital stay. You need to be in the hospital inpatient for three nights as opposed to observation status, which is something to uh, keep an eye on. So, so I just wanted to point out the difference between Medicaid long-term and Medicare short-term. Aaron, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, the hotline and uh, COVID precautions? Absolutely. So I know Dan mentioned earlier, and we recognize that there's concern out there about admitting your loved one into skilled nursing facilities. But for some families, it still may be the best solution. You know, the, the risk of having a loved one stay home may still be greater than the risks associated with having them transition to a long-term care facility. And there are many safe places out there without incidents of COVID-19. So we understand that there are a lot of questions uh, that people may have about this. And the Massachusetts Department of Public Health has started a newly dedicated hotline to assist families with questions and concerns about their loved one's care at nursing home and assisted living facilities during this pandemic. They'll also be able to answer questions about the facility's COVID-19 testing status. The hotline is staffed by live personnel seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And if you're struggling with a situation with a loved one at home, please reach out to us. We can help you find the right place and provide support for Medicaid eligibility. So let's talk about the actual asset limits for Medicaid eligibility. Um, it depends if you're a single person or a couple. For a single person applying for Medicaid, it's a $2,000 asset limit. So that's $2,000 in countable assets. And most things are countable. There's certainly a list of things that are not countable. You know, for example, your IRAs are countable, your CDs are countable. Um, one vehicle is not countable. Your second car is countable. One primary residence is not countable. Your second house or vacation home is countable. You know, um, term life insurance is not countable, um, but the cash value of whole life insurance is countable. So that's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a sense of the things that we'll walk you through to determine what your countable assets are, and, and we can take advantage of those rules. So $2,000 in countable assets for the applicant spouse, the sick spouse. And if you're a married couple, the spouse at home, the non-applicant spouse, right now is able to keep $128,640 in 2020. So that number changes usually every year. So that's the countable asset limit for the spouse at home, 128000 and change. So um, there are lots of things that we can do under the regulations legally to protect assets if your situation is that you have more than that. And we'll follow the rules and show you where in the regulations that is allowable. Um, if both spouses are applying, if both spouses need nursing home care, really at the same time, which happens, they 
have a combined asset limit of three thousand dollars. So a little more challenging to do planning um, for both spouses. So usually we want to get started early, usually five years before the care is needed to get the best result. So as you can probably sense, a, a Medicaid application, if we're trying to protect assets, can be really involved and complex uh, based upon the regulations and how MassHealth applies the regulations on every, any given week or month. So if you have a loved one who needs skilled nursing home care, whether it's our firm or another, please see an experienced elder law attorney uh, who is familiar and experienced with these rules. They can be complex, in it, and a good attorney can really maximize the amount of assets that are being saved. Thanks, Dan. Just as a, a brief summary or recap, we've talked to you today about some of the important estate planning documents to have in place. Your power of attorney, healthcare proxy, personal directive, HIPAA authorization, will, and maybe a revocable living trust. We've talked a little bit about some of the mass health programs out there that are designed to help provide services at home or help pay for skilled nursing care if that's appropriate. One final takeaway that I have for you um, from today's program is to be sure to review your beneficiary designations. In Massachusetts, assets that you own individually when you pass away, so no joint owner on them, no beneficiary designation in place, will pass through your probate estate and through the probate court. Assets such as bank accounts, IRAs, life insurance, and annuities have the ability for you to designate a beneficiary, the person who will inherit that asset when you pass away. So when the beneficiary is properly updated at your passing, your beneficiary will receive the funds from those accounts outright, unless, of course, you've designated a trust as your beneficiary, in which case the terms of that trust will govern how and when your beneficiaries have access to those assets. Naming a trust as beneficiary can be a good idea if your beneficiaries are minors, have special needs, or the intended beneficiary just isn't a good money manager. So naming beneficiaries means that probate, attorney's fees, and other costs associated with settling estates can be avoided. So I'd just like to recommend that you call your financial institution or check online to review your beneficiary designation. And if you haven't, complete your beneficiary designation or update them if you have any changes that you want to make. Thank you, Dan and Erin. Uh, there are quite a few helpful insights in that presentation. As you've been presenting, we've received some questions from our audience. But before we move into the Q&A portion of the webinar, I would like to share with our participants how they can request a consultation with the attorneys of Serpinot and Bineski and or get some more helpful information. If you are interested in getting your estate plan in place to have the peace of mind that your family, money, and property will be taken care of, our team can help. To be sure that you and your family stay safe and healthy during this difficult time, our firm is offering phone and online consultations. Online meetings are easy to access. In fact, we have a quick instructional video that we can send to you to make it super easy. Online meetings are more like an in-person meeting, whereas you and the attorney can see each other via video and the attorney can share their screen with you and you can see the documents being referenced. Our process is simple. You complete your consultant co consultation prep worksheet and this allows the attorney to review your information prior to the meeting, making your time with them more productive. If you are interested in being contacted to book a free consultation, respond to the survey at the end of the webinar. Free consultations will be honored through April 30th. And during your consultation, the attorney will provide you with recommendations to meet your goals and share the associated pricing. At that point, you can determine what aspects of the recommended plan you wish to move forward with. If you are interested in more information on the topics shared today, please visit our website, myfamilyestateplanning.com, where you will also find our blog full of helpful articles, and you can sign up for our newsletter.
We also have two print pieces to offer to you. Our 2020 edition of the Community Resource Guide, Retirement and Beyond, which is a magazine with helpful articles, case studies, and local resource listings. We also have a book co-authored by managing partner, Michelle Bineski, Protect Your Family. If you are interested in receiving a free copy of either publication, please indicate so in the survey supplied at the close of the webinar. Now let's bring back Dan and Erin to respond to the questions that we've received. All right, Dan, the first question, I have a signed healthcare proxy and five wishes document, including a DNR, DNI. Is this enough for my healthcare decisions? You have a healthcare proxy, a, a do not resuscitate, and a HIPAA release? No, uh, the do not resuscitate and a five wishes document. And a five wishes, okay. Um, almost. <laughs> um, healthcare proxy is great, and the five wishes is essentially a living will or an advanced directive that I had talked about a little earlier. So that's great. And our living will is pretty similar to the five wishes um, document that you can find online. So we have a bit more in ours, but that'll do the job um, in a pinch. So what I would add to that for, now this is not for financial protection or probate avoidance, but strictly those documents are regarding medical treatment. Um, I would add a HIPAA release to that list, a standalone HIPAA release like Aaron talked about. And by standalone, I mean it's not tied to a specific institution. It's not I authorize Dr. So-and-so's office to release my medical records, but rather it's general. So if you wind up at Mass General or, or uh, Charlton Memorial or wherever, you can have that HIPAA um, authorization. HIPAA is the medical privacy law, so it prevents doctors and hospitals from mm -hmm. talking to anyone or ambulance billing companies from uh, talking to your daughter and, and working out a bill or Blue Cross Blue Shield from talking to your kids and, and working out a coverage issue. So that freestanding HIPAA release really is, the, is what I would add to the documents that you already have in place. All right, great. Yeah, the only thing and that I'd add, oh, uh, Krista, uh, I was just yep, going to say, ahead. the only thing that I would add to that um, is that, you know, not all documents are created equal, as you can imagine. So although you have those documents in place, it might be a good idea to have the healthcare proxy reviewed by an attorney. Um, if it's the type of healthcare proxy that you got from your primary care physician's office or at the hospital because you were having surgery, um, it may not contemplate, um, you know, some of the, the issues that can arise during your retirement years. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty general document, and there are some specific um, medical considerations that it doesn't cover. Things like what happens if you did need to transition uh, to a skilled nursing facility, or if you were ever diagnosed with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia and needed special medication for that. Uh, those general healthcare proxies that you get from the hospital or the doctor's office don't, um, don't have the authorities included within them to allow your healthcare proxy to make decisions regarding those situations. Great, thank you, Erin. Let's um, move on to the next question. And, um, Perhaps you can answer this um, for them, Erin. Some agencies require that um, they use their own form uh, to be signed rather than the standard HIPAA release um, that may come from a doctor or insurance company. I recently went through an application for long-term disability. Some agencies, medical offices, hospitals required their own form to be signed rather than the one provided by my insurance company. Is there a standard form that everyone must take in order to get records released? You know, I'll be perfectly honest, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, our HIPAA authorization is, is pretty broad, and I'm not aware of, of any law that's in place that 
uh, says that one specific company can only accept, you know, their form that they prepare. If you were in a situation where someone needed to access your medical information and the doctor's office or the hospital were giving pushback um, as to the, the general, uh, the, the broad form that we had prepared for you, I would absolutely push back on that. Sure. Um, I, I'll, I'll just expand on that. I think that push comes to shove, they'd have to accept your general HIPAA release if, if you didn't have theirs filled out and you now lacked mental capacity. I think the law is on your side there. Of course, nobody wants to be in a battle with a, with a facility or a doctor's office during crunch time. So um, the short answer is if they have their own form and you have mental capacity, my advice would be to sign their form. Uh, in addition, that whether they're right or wrong, that'll grease the wheels so that uh, everyone can talk. And I can also add that our HIPAA release follows the federal law and has never in the 15 years that I've been doing this been rejected. So, um, so I, I hope that is helpful. Okay, before we move on to the next question, I just want to remind the audience that's listening, if you have any questions for Dan and Erin, um, please go ahead and submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom left of your screen. All right, uh, Dan, the next question is about um, the five-year look-back period. Um, someone's looking for you to explain what that might be. Okay, the five-year look-back period is a Medicaid rule. So it's in the context of we want Medicaid or MassHealth to pay for someone's care. And um, it's really specific to nursing home Medicaid. So the five-year rule is that Medicaid or MassHealth gets to look back five years from the date that you're applying to see if you've made any gift, um, any transfers of assets for less than what they're worth is a gift. And if you have made a gift within the five years, they're going to give you a penalty, a period of time where they won't pay for your stay. So the bigger the gift within five years, the bigger the penalty or period of non-payment. And it roughly breaks down to every $10,000 that you gift is a one month of non-payment that may cost you twelve dollars or $14,000 to get through. So we're really looking hard when we're doing a Medicaid application to see if there have been any gifts. Essentially, people, uh, Medicaid doesn't want people giving away their assets one day and getting on Medicaid the next. That's why they have this five-year rule. So there are exceptions a number of exceptions to the five-year rule, which are probably beyond today's scope. And we'll look for those exceptions in your case. And if none of them apply, there are other ways to try to get the penalty waived, like a uh, hardship waiver or some other um, uh, strategies. So uh, that's what the five-year look-back period is, to penalize gifts if you've made them and are applying for nursing home uh, Medicaid. Great. Erin, um, the next question is, um, if I have some of these documents already, how often do you recommend that I get them reviewed? That's a great question. So it, it's wonderful um, if you have documents in place, but it's important that you not just stick them on the shelf and not look at them for 20 years because your life changes, the law changes, and if those documents need to be used, you want to make sure that they're going to be accepted. So in our office, uh, we generally would recommend that you have them reviewed every three years. Um, if you are a client of our, our firm, um, we invite you back in for a free meeting, actually, every three years to review what you put in place, refresh your memory on what you did and why, and make sure that uh, we don't need to tweak the plan in, in some way because of a change in your life or a change in the law. All right, great. Um, thank you both, Dan and Erin. And um, we're going to move away from the Q&A. Um, 
As a reminder to our audience, uh, stay tuned for the survey that was mentioned. It will come up as we close the webinar. There you can indicate interest in being contacted for a free consultation or having one of our free books mailed to you. We do appreciate that you took the time to join us for today's webinar. We look forward to the opportunity to serve you and your family. Stay healthy and be well. Thank you.